Uh, Chris, we've talked a little bit about chronic pancreatitis, how it's a syndrome, and how to make a diagnosis. Once that's been established, then the physician is uh, faced with the challenge of starting to treat some of the signs and symptoms and the underlying pathology. Uh, a lot of the complications of pancreatic injury and inflammation are familiar to us, and the case we discussed of this young woman with uh, intractable pain really highlights the worst problem that uh, we face as, as clinicians. There are other complications that are a little bit more direct, but why don't we start by talking about management of pain. How do you manage pain in patients like the one you described and others who have different patterns of pain? The, f the first thing I try to do is to make sure that I understand the pattern of pain. So I uh, will ask the patient to keep a pain diary for a few weeks to try to help me better understand uh, the character of the pain, the severity of the pain, the impact of pain on their, on their life in general. I think everybody, we start with uh, a variety of medical therapies. We have a few that are available to us. Certainly abstinence is one of the key uh, parts of medical therapy, so abstinence from alcohol and even more importantly, perhaps, from tobacco. And I tell patients that abstinence, um, the effect on pain is unpredictable, but it has a beneficial effect on the natural history and their future mm -hmm. uh, uh, life. So most patients are agreeable uh, to that approach. I think most patients will need some form of analgesic to control pain. Uh, there is data that using uh, uh, less potent narcotics, an agent like tramadol, for instance, is, um, can be equally effective as using more potent narcotics. So many of my patients begin on a low potency drug like tramadol to try to control pain. Uh, many of these patients will also get um, uh, treated with an adjunctive agent. Uh, uh, some of those might include tricyclic antidepressants or the selective serotonin re uh, reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, or even uh, gabapentoids like uh, pregabalin. Uh, and those uh, have been studied uh, largely pregabalin in small randomized controlled trials and seem to have some beneficial effect uh, as well. There's been a recent trial, I think, that's been a randomized uh, placebo-controlled crossover study that did show a benefit, and I think that there's a growing uh, consensus that that uh, form of therapy may uh, play an important role. And so I usually discuss that particular agent with my patients and uh, recommend that or another gabapentoid. Um, and I think the effect of those types of medical strategies is often uh, moderate. It's uh, not very common that that in and of itself is sufficient to eliminate pain, but it may control pain to a point that's much more uh, manageable. Uh, some patients, um, I may start on antioxidants. The, the data on antioxidants is mixed, and I don't think there's consistency across all studies that I would recommend it to all patients, but it's another adjunctive part of medical treatment. I think the one thing we have learned about the antioxidants is that it does not provide pain relief in people with alcoholic chronic pancreatitis. Uh, there may be some subset of idiopathic in which it has a benefit, but I think we need to be a little bit smarter about how we do trials and patient selection to really understand that. I totally agree. And the other medical therapy that's I think many of these patients receive are pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, many of those patients are receiving it because they have exocrine insufficiency, not because of pain. And there is, uh, again, uh, uh, modest data on the effectiveness of enzymes for controlling uh, pain. Uh, but uh, for most uh, patients, I think that's not uh, um, uh, commonly included in the medical therapy for pain alone. It's included for treatment of exocrine insufficiency. But when, when you're speaking benefit. of pain, though, you've, you've said there's a variety of pains. And uh, what type of pain, in your experience, is one that might respond to uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy? Well, it's, I don't know that I can define a specific pattern. The, the patients that have postprandial exacerbations mm -hmm. seem to be the group that's most likely to respond. But certainly I have seen patients in, with other uh, pain patterns who have had some uh, a modest response to enzyme therapy as well. Uh, but again, I think the main focus of enzyme therapy is directed at, at exocrine insufficiency. So I would guess that approximately um, half of patients who are treated medically 
uh, continue on medical therapy for some period of time, and the other half move on to some other form uh, of therapy. And it varies from population to population, but obviously the next steps they're considering would be things like endoscopic therapy um, or surgical therapy. And um, there have now been some randomized trials comparing endoscopic to surgical therapy. They're uh, not perfect trials. They're relatively small. The follow-up is perhaps not great. But I think the message from those studies is that um, surgery uh, is more durable and more effective than endoscopic therapy. So when I have patients who are considering moving on to the next step, which is endoscopic or surgical therapy, I have that discussion with them as well uh, to talk about the pros and cons of the two approaches. Now, uh, along the same lines, we just uh, recently uh, published a paper from the NAPS two patients that were at the University of Pittsburgh where we had very detailed evaluation of the patients. Uh, we had very careful follow-up for more than five years. And what we found is that the patients that were thought to be uh, good candidates for endoscopic therapy, about half of them got better and half of them did not get better. The ones that did not get better went on to surgery and half of those had uh, significant improvement and uh, the other half didn't. So three quarters of the patients that we thought were, uh, could be managed with endoscopic or, or surgical therapy actually benefited. The other interesting feature, and we've talked on, about this before, is that the patients that were most likely to respond were the ones that were treated early. If the treatment was delayed for a long period of time, nothing worked. And it's, it's interesting, and if you look at most of the papers that have looked at endoscopic and surgical therapy, uh, those are not patients early in the clinical course who are being treated. They're patients that have a dilated pancreatic duct, so the, big enough for the surgeon to find or big enough for the endoscopist to stent right. or remove a stone. Um, and so the fact that, that those therapies are not routinely or universally uh, successful is not a surprise. It is interesting when you think about the endoscopic and surgical approaches, they're really only applicable to a subset of patients yes. with a dilated pancreatic duct, and they really take a high degree of endoscopic skill uh, uh, to manage some of these folks. Most of the patients that fit into that category that I have that conversation with about endoscopic or surgical therapy uh, choose endoscopic approaches first because they want to avoid surgery, but I do think it's important to have an honest discussion with the patient as to the the pros and cons. The young lady that we talked about has a, a very severe chronic pain syndrome, but she doesn't have a dilated pancreatic duct. And so that's a group that's particularly challenging uh, to manage because there's little in the way of endoscopic therapy you can offer, perhaps with the exception of a, a transient or temporary celiac plexus block. Which she had. Yes. And uh, was that effective? And if it was not effective in this patient, and in my experience, even when, if, when it is effective, it's very short-lived. And so I don't use that in patients like this. But we have very few surgical options either in these patients, with the exception, perhaps, of total pancreatectomy with islet cell autotransplant. And that's not a procedure that I've developed a lot of enthusiasm for at this point, just due to the fact that islet harvesting techniques are not perfect. Many patients still need insulin, and pain is not, you know, automatically or universally right. relieved. So there's a major risk with it, and it's irreversible. And they're going to be uh, required to take uh, full doses of pancreatic enzyme with every meal and every snack for every day of their life. The last uh, comment I'd like to make is that uh, a lot of the problems the patients have with pain is just coping with the disease and the depression, uh, uh, and uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, sometimes behavioral therapy also helps uh, getting a better understanding of their disease, learning to cope with pain. Some of those techniques can be helpful as well and reduce the overutilization of healthcare facilities or a lot of the, the depression and other things that, uh, that really make any pain much worse. So there's a lot we're learning about this uh, disorder and uh, I think we're beginning to make some progress, but again, Early diagnosis and better therapies, I think, are what we really need. And that is such a key point, the idea of helping patients cope. I think the majority of patients I see with chronic pancreatitis, they're not pain-free, but their pain is reduced to a manageable level. And if you can assist them in coping, that can be good enough for many of these patients. I agree.